Hello and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Ryan Jane, Senior Policy Counsel with FFRF. This week's show is brought to you by the FFRF Action Fund, the lobbying arm of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, dedicated to ensuring that our laws remain secular in order to protect the constitutional separation between state and church. Today, we're going to be talking about advocacy at the state and local levels and about grassroots advocacy in general. As always, we want to hear what you think about activating the grassroots. Put your comments in the Facebook chat below or send your questions to askanatheist at ffrf.org. So what's the quickest and easiest way for you to get more connected to the issues you care about? I'm going to show you. So what, I, what you're looking at right now is our website, ffrfaction.org. And I'm going to introduce you to our new action center. It's new and improved. So what you do at the website, you go to take action on the top, click on action center. And what I'm going to do is sign up a pretend person to show you how easy it is to get involved. So here's our action center. And what you'll see here is if you scroll down a bit, you'll see on the left are campaigns that you can take action on. On the right is where you log in. So if you're already plugged into our system, you might already be logged in. Otherwise, you just uh, type in your information. So for example, I'm going to log in here as Mr. Thomas Jefferson, who of course lives at 1050 Monticello Loop in Charlottesville, Virginia. So you find your address. It must be a real street address because we have to know who your representatives are, what district you live in. And we'll give him Jefferson of a gun at hotmail.com. Phone number if you want. If you're interested, we uh, can uh, allow you to contact your reps via, via phone, which is actually more effective than email. So I recommend putting a phone number if you have one. But this is obviously not a real person, so I'm just going to leave it blank for now. And once you put in your information, the really cool thing is that you are now in our system. So anytime that we see an opportunity to send you an action alert, something that needs action taken on any state church issue, we can send you an email or a text message allowing you to take action using our automated system. Now also, looking back at the website, the, on the right, what you can see is a picture of all of your elected officials. So this goes, in the case of you know, Mr. Thomas Jefferson in Virginia, all the way from your U.S. Senator, like Tim Kaine here, all the way down to your local elected officials and everything in between, including state reps. So the first thing you can do once you sign up is take a look at these people. And if these are unfamiliar names, unfamiliar faces, just take a moment to reach out to them. Because especially some of these people, people who you know, might be a, a supervisor at your county level, if you don't know who that person is, they probably don't hear from very many constituents. So it's worth your time to take a look at who they are and figure out, you know, maybe I can just call this number, look them up on Facebook, find their email, if you happen to know who they are, you can also log a relationship, let them know, hey, I went to high school with this person, or whatever it may be. Now, the, the other really amazing thing about our, uh, our action center is that you can take action on our action alerts. So for example, this one says, take action, urge your governor to end child marriage. In Virginia, uh, we are sponsoring a bill that would help to put an end to child marriage in Virginia. Now, in this case, because we're, we're testing this out, I already did it. So it says you've already participated in this campaign. But if this was the first time you were in, what you would see is a pre-written message with our suggested talking points. And all you would have to do is click the button that says send, and it would send an email to, in this case, the governor. And then after that, you would have the option of calling his office. It's super easy. And if you wanted to go in and edit your own message, it's a piece of cake to do that. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to sign yourself up at the FFRF Action Fund Action Center. Once again, just go to ffrfaction.org, go over to the Take Action button, and click on Action Center. And I'm pleased now to be joined by Jason Bennell, who is the president of Iowa 
atheists and free thinkers and is a, a grassroots advocacy expert as well. Welcome to the show, Jason. Well, thanks so much for having me here. So I want to talk about a few different, uh, different aspects of this, including first and foremost, why it is that we focus on state and local issues so much and uh, how it is that we go about kind of mobilizing our grassroots secularists. So the, the first point that I want to make and get your thoughts on, Jason, is so I think people underappreciate how little uh, reps hear from their constituents at the late local and state level. If you're a, a U.S. congressman, you get inundated with requests for you to do things, right? You have so many constituents who are just constantly writing to you about all sorts of different things. But at the state and especially at the local level, what we often hear is that people just don't hear from their constituents. So you can have much more impact reaching out to people at that level. Uh, is that something that you've seen or any other thoughts on that? Uh, I would say that's absolutely true. Um, when you have the local officials, you can actually pull them aside and have a one-on-one -on -one meeting to them in an open and honest way that you probably couldn't do with a state or a federal rep because they have three levels of bureaucracy. But at the local level, these ordinances and laws have a more direct impact and you can directly shape them by meeting with those people. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me. And you also, you, know, you can connect, you can often meet with these policymakers one-on-one -on -one, and they will actually remember your face. You can talk to this person mm -hmm. as an individual, uh, whereas you know it's, it's great to go do um, lobbying in DC and meet with your rep or your senator's office, but typically the best you're gonna get after you make your way to DC is you'll talk to a staffer who will you know, log your concern and tell their boss. That's usually the more, at the most you'll get a few minutes with like a, a US rep, it's pretty, pretty tough. But especially at the local level, you could just grab coffee with a, a county commissioner or something like that really, really easily. That's absolutely true. Uh, a lot of times when you have these meetings and these sessions uh, at the even state and federal level, uh, as you say, you'll get kind of politely rebuffed. But at the local level, you can really go and actually go to the planning meetings themselves, because often they're public, help shape those meetings and bring up questions ahead of times. And then that representative may even use your questions verbatim because you're the person who put them in front of them so that they can really focus on this issue. You have a almost outsized influence at the local level. So I'm a big believer in uh, going local as much and as often as you can. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, something else, the and to try to sell the idea that I was talking about just a moment ago about signing up for our uh, at our action center is a, a lot of our state church advocates are not one issue voters, right? And we don't want you to be. We don't want people to only care about state church separation. I, I think most people who care about how their government works, uh, they care about lots of different issues. So I think it's too much to ask of any one concerned person to try to be an expert on every different topic that's important to them. So it makes sense when there are groups like uh, the Iowa Atheist and Freethinkers, you guys do a great job of tracking legislation. And also, of course, at the FFRF Action Fund, we track legislation in all 50 states. You've got to connect with groups like that that specialize in particular areas and will tell you the best time to actually take action. Yeah, that's something we've really embraced uh, here at Iowa Atheists and Freethinkers is getting people engaged and encouraging them to not only vote, obviously, uh, but to pay attention to what's going on because you can shape some of these uh, legislative priorities. Um, not a single issue voter for sure, but if nobody's talking about church-state separation, then nothing gets addressed about it and it gets run right over as we've seen. Uh, that, that's something that I'm quite proud to, to say that we've done a really good job of here in, in Iowa. Um, can you talk a little bit more about some of the things that, uh, that you've seen in Iowa this legislative session so far? So something that we've done, uh, and this is unique for us this session, is we actually became uh, registered lobbyists. This is a, uh, it's a nonpartisan tool, but it's a really good way to make it known on the permanent record where your organization stands. And so we've selected a whole bunch of bills that we registered either for or against as an organization that communicates to the public where we stand. And if folks associate IAF, Iowa Atheists and Freethinkers, with separation of church and state, they can see as lobbying for or against a bill, and that tells them where they maybe should stand on this particular issue. So that's something that we've we've done quite a bit. 
Um, if you wanted specifics, um, here in Iowa, we actually saw uh, a RIFRA uh, law go into effect uh, that was recently signed, something we, we registered against. Uh, we also had private school vouchers that go primarily to religious institutions with little to no oversight, which is another unfortunate uh, occurrence, uh, as well as we were help, helped uh, to defeat some of these bills that would have, for example, um, outlawed Satanism um, and specifically privileging one religion over another. Those did not make it to the, the full uh, House or Senate. So uh, those are just some of the examples that we've seen here in Iowa. Sure, and we can kind of wonk out for a minute just to make sure people are, are following some of the, the uh, those particular things. So you mentioned RIFRA. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, that's the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which federally applies to federal laws, but uh, on state matters is up to each state. Um, so that's an important, very dangerous piece of legislation that we do not want to see enacted in other states. And then you mentioned vouchers. Uh, um, a pattern that we're seeing in private school vouchers is not just to enact new programs, but it's to create what they call universal vouchers. So the old selling point of private school vouchers used to be that, yes, we're diverting money from public schools to private schools, but the reason we're doing it is because we're giving people school choice. We're giving people options, and particularly people who can't afford private schools and struggling public schools. But now with universal vouchers, that narrative is really being abandoned. And they're just saying, no, we want everybody to be able to transfer dollars from public schools to private schools. Doesn't matter if you are the wealthiest person in the state and your kids already go to private schools, you should be able to, uh, to siphon money out of public schools just like everyone else. And even if these are, as they usually are, private religious schools teaching religious instruction with taxpayer money, which of course, that's the reason that we care about it as much as we do. Uh, we also, you know, you mentioned Satanism, so we're, uh, <laughs> we've been tracking these public school chaplain bills in states all over the country, and that's one of the, there, there are a lot of things we could talk about on, on that issue, but one of them that's, that's interesting is the idea of having satanic chaplains. And I think some of the states rightfully are being, that's the wake-up call for them that, oh, wait, this bill's a terrible idea. I don't want a satanic chaplain in my school. And so, uh, but at the same time, it is kind of alarming that there's this satanic panic going on, and Iowa is definitely ground zero in a way for that. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, we, we, if, for folks who may not know, we did have a, a satanic uh, holiday display alongside the IAF one at the state capitol, and it was uh, destroyed by a avowed Christian nationalist. Uh, so that really kind of put the satanic panic into high gear here in Iowa. Uh, and you also mentioned the chaplaincy. Uh, that was also another bill that was brought forward. And just as you say, Ryan, um, the satanic temple was excited to become uh, chaplains, and suddenly the bill lost a lot of interest in the legislature and did not go forward at that point, you know. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, it'll be interesting to see how those uh, play out in other states, but uh, Iowa especially has just all sorts of interesting things going on. And one thing I wanted to say about state advocacy generally is that uh, every state has its own unique quirks that you have to learn. And so you're a good example, Jason, where I've learned a lot from you about how Iowa works, what goes on there, just because you have a lot of experience working there. And then I've connected with advocates in other states who are experts there. So like for one example, a strange thing that happened this year in Oklahoma, they had a, uh, a chaplain bill that was dead, but then what they did is they took a different bill and they shucked it, which is apparently an Oklahoma legislative <laughs> procedural term where they took a totally unrelated bill, shucked it like corn, got rid of all the, all, all the stuff, and then just replaced it with the dead chaplain bill in order to try to resurrect it. Uh, so you, you have to learn all sorts of these little unique quirks. So the good news, of course, is wherever you live, all you have to do is learn your particular state's quirks. Uh, it's the, the rare person who finds himself in whatever circle of hell that I've ended up in where I have to try to learn all 50 of them. Uh, but are there any, uh, any oddities in Iowa that you can speak to that you've, you've dealt with? There there. The answer is yes and no. There are some unique uh, quirks to the way legislation is done in Iowa. However, we have had uh, for the past few years a lock by one political party. So a lot of those quirks have unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your view, they've become irrelevant uh, because they kind of can do whatever they want when they want. Uh, for example, uh, shucking is not a term I'm familiar with, but it's something they have attempted to do here in Iowa in regard to some of the education bills. And one was defeated. And so what they did, I think it was called a rewrite 
and they said, oh, we didn't mean that, we mean this. And they have the same bill name and the same title, but all the text within the bill may be very, very different. And if you're not watching and paying attention, paying attention and reading all of that, you may very well think you're voting for the same bill that was presented two days ago, and it, the text in it has almost completely changed. In this example, it was a complete change. Uh, so that might be one very small oddity that uh, I, I think I think the solution to this is to just be engaged and, and be an advocate and you can be on top of these things. Absolutely. That's very tricky. I also remember there's a tendency in Iowa to try to rush things through mm. with minimal public knowledge, right? So if they know something's going to be controversial, they have ways to just kind of slide it through the process right when the session opens so that it just gets right through. And by the time people know about it, it's already too late to, to stop it, which, as you said, is another reason to be engaged. And it's also another reason to plug in with groups that are on top of these things, that have their finger on the pulse and can tell you, hey, there's a hearing about this tomorrow. It just got scheduled. We got to take action right now. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a, a big thing we're pushing for here at, at IAF is even if you don't want to become an activist yourself and you don't want to be in, super out there and involved, if anything, we're a resource for what bills are coming down uh, you know, through the funnel, what's being considered, just a way to stay informed. Uh, con connecting to your local organizations can be a very powerful tool to do that. Yeah. Now, I wanted to mention a lot of state legislatures now are adjourning at this time of year. Uh, we are in the uh, second year of what is typically a two-year legislative cycle for most states, there's a couple exceptions, but a lot of states are closing right now. Their legislatures are shutting down shop. Uh, so this map is uh, the most accurate one I could find online, although it's actually not perfect. There's a few examples, like Kentucky is closed, Idaho is closed, Iowa, as you know, is about to close. So there's, uh, you know, there's a few mistakes on there, but it's very close where the gray states are already adjourned, the white ones are not in session, um, and the green ones still are, but in April and uh, May, we'll see about half of those green states adjourn as well. So we'll be entering a period of kind of dormancy in the state legislative world until next January, which being an odd numbered year, this is when 48 states start a new legislative session, a new two-year session. So basically all the states are gonna fire into motion all at once. So to me, what that means is this is going to be your time to organize and get prepared. And it's a great time to talk to your representatives as well, because right now a lot of them are scrambling to figure out what they're doing about a lot of this last minute uh, legislation. But as soon as that is done, they're going to be uh, potentially focused on you know, getting reelected if they have to. A lot of them are thinking about that kind of thing, but that means they want to hear from their constituents and hear what's important to you, what should we be focused on uh, in the future. So if you don't know about your particular state's legislative calendar, uh, you can you can look that up a number of ways. The easiest thing is just to, to Google it. So if you, know, if you live in, in Georgia, for instance, you'll see that it's, it's adjourned, but you would just Google um, Georgia legislative calendar and it should pop right up. Uh, and once it is, once you're past that legislative session, you obviously won't be getting any action alerts from us about bills because there aren't any live bills. But again, this is the time to reach out and connect with your representatives. Yeah, that, that that's absolutely. I, I just want to. I can't stress that enough. A lot of folks take it for granted that they're. Th they're I'm just going to Google it. I'm just going to call meet them, make them recognize you. You're much more likely to get a meeting if they recognize your name and your face or your organization. That can go a, such a long way in local politics. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about, Jason, is some of the work that you have done. Uh, and uh, one thing is, you know, we are a, a group that's always advocated for secularism and non-religious non Americans, and you're a group of atheists and free thinkers. Um, but we have certainly learned, and I'm sure you feel the same way, that it is crucial to have strong partners and not just in kind of the secular bubble. Um, so can you talk about some of the work that, that you've done with either interfaith groups or other nonprofits? Yes, uh, that's actually been extremely important in raising the profile of not just our organization, but church and state separation. Um, there's a good organization here in central Iowa called the Interfaith Alliance of Iowa. Um, we do some events with them uh, being a secular voice. Um, in the past, I've actually helped uh, write uh, some of the secular prayers and invocations that they've had in the, at the State House. That's a really good way to, to raise your profile. Uh, but also, we recently attended an event called uh, Religious Freedom for All. It was actually 
a joint project between uh, some of the universities, the LDS Church, some Catholic organizations, and us, the atheists and, and uh, free thinkers. And that was a really good way to get in front of some of fo- some of the folks that otherwise would never consider church and state separation to be an important issue. Um, especially when you look at some of these organizations like the LDS that themselves are considered a minority religion, they have a very big vested interest in the separation of church and state. And it shows when they invite groups like us to come and speak and and host panels and uh, have that dialogue. And I mean, those are the organizations that get people like the governor, you know, your state senator, some big names come and show up to these events because they see interfaith as as an important uh, aspect of their uh, constituency. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it also, I think it helps to break down some of the stigma that a lot of people have about atheists and free thinkers, where they think that we are, you know, uh, we're angry and militant, right? You always hear these attached to them. And uh, it it helps to show that, no, we're interested in actually getting things done. We're interested in coalition building and Mm -hmm. finding partners, even if we may not agree on, you know, specific theological views or whatever it may be. That doesn't mean that we can't work together with like-minded partners to, to get things done. Uh, I also, I, I often like to remind people, just you know, the uh, legal history nerd in me, that um, it has not always been atheists and freethinkers who are the ones standing up for First Amendment rights and state church separation. Uh, we've been there the, pretty much the whole time, but alongside, there are some major cases where you have um, Jehovah's Witnesses and Catholic groups who are fighting for these issues because when you're in the minority, uh, you feel the problems when state church rights are violated. So that's a reminder that you, you know, state church separation is not just for non-religious people. Mm -hmm. Um, Famously, the uh, the founders understood that when you separate state and church, it is better for both. And that is a piece of education that I think is, is really lacking when atheists are the only standard bearers of state church separation. So I think that's something we really need to kind of disentangle. I I agree. That's actually every time I've done any kind of interfaith group uh, or or event, that is what I lead with. And and it's it's helpful because it's true. Uh, Religion and government exist in more purity, the more separate they are. I believe that was a John Adams quote. Um, When you pull some of those historical examples up and point to uh, religious groups that have benefited from the church-state separation issue, um, they are much more um, happy to get on board and stand with the atheists and free thinkers rather than find them as uh, adversaries. Um, for a good example, again, is I recently did a panel last week, and on the panel was a Satanist, a humanist, and a uh, LDS member. And all three uh, were huge advocates for church-state separation. And I can tell you that that room was full of probably 80% LDS and Catholics. That's the first time they had ever seen a Satanist in person. And I will tell you, they have a much better understanding and acceptance of different religious views after that event than they did when they started. It's very powerful to be local and in person. Absolutely. It makes sense. And yeah, just think about the impact that it has when people meet their first atheist or Satanist and they find out that they're not the monster that their church may have told (laughs) them they've always been. Uh, So we're going to switch to taking uh, viewer questions in a moment, if we have any. But first, I want to give you a chance to uh, talk about any of the other work that Iowa Atheists and Freethinkers has been up to lately and any any other shout outs you want to make. Sure. Uh, Well, uh, now that the session is winding down and a lot of our legislative advocacy is coming to an end, uh, we're focusing more on the nice weather and social events. Uh, We're all signed up to be uh, in our downtown Des Moines Farmers Market. This is an excellent venue. If you're ever in Des Moines for the Farmers Market, please stop by. Um, but you can see the atheists there will be uh, sharing church date separation information and uh, letting people know that, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's an organization here in central Iowa that is uh, for equality and, and for all of the good uh, aspects of democracy. So I want to shout out the farmer's market. We're also doing some other events at the Des Moines Pride Parade. We're always happy to be there. And then the big the big event, uh, this is one that you were, I believe, at last year, was the Iowa Secular Summit. That's coming up here in June. Uh, you can hit that up at on our website or iowasecularsummit.org. This is where we have a diverse multi-faith panel come and, and just give good presentations on how important church-state separation is. I, I want to give that a big shout out to uh, Spots are limited, so uh, please do check that out sooner than later. 
Very cool. And absolutely, you guys have, have hosted me a couple times, and I can uh, definitely say it's one of the one of the good groups that has you know active members, members, lots of events. So if you're if you're local to uh, to Iowa and the Des Moines area, definitely check out IAF. They are awesome. Now we do have a few questions, and a couple of these are uh, I think best. Uh, given to you, Jason. So the first one directly is curious, uh, how did you personally get started in local advocacy? Oh, uh, I uh, I just joined the group because uh, I wanted to have a place to hang out on the weekends. This is about 10 to 12 years ago. And I just stuck around because I saw how important the work was. And as folks, you know, dropped off or moved or things changed, I just found myself caring very much about this topic and taking a leadership role. Uh, I, I know it's a generic response, but just get involved. Show up to the meetings and just put your name down to volunteer for something, whether it's just signing people in, checking folks at the door, or if you want to actually organize something like a social happy hour. That's how this starts. Uh, you, we can be correct as we like on church state separation, but if we don't have a community building, then it's not going to be for, you know, not going to be long lasting. Just show up. That's really the best way to do it. Yeah. So that ties into the next question as well, uh, where someone asked, are there other ways to get involved on local levels in addition to joining an advocacy chapter and signing up for action alerts? So in addition to what you, you, know, you were just describing, showing up and getting involved with uh, something like IAF, and I showed earlier how to sign up for um, our action center. Uh, what else can folks do if they want to get involved at a grassroots level? Yeah, absolutely. For, yeah, start, just get on those action alerts. Um, I, I will say this is a big step, but it's one that I took. Run for office. Uh, run for office or join your local political groups. I know uh, we are a non, uh, nonpartisan nonprofit, but that doesn't mean as an individual you can't kind of get your uh, – you know, rub the shoulders with the folks who do make those decisions, because rather than having to uh, ask for the right thing to be done, why not have folks who actually believe in having the right thing done be done and just be there yourself? So I would say running for office or getting involved in actual direct political groups. Um, volunteering, um, even if you don't want to join a group like Iowa Atheists and Freethinkers, but you find yourself to be a secular person, find a way to volunteer and let it be known that you're a non-religious person. That goes miles when it comes to uh, reducing the stigma on uh, what it means to be an atheist. And it also helps build that community so that folks can point to you and say, hey, this is a person that's willing to volunteer their time. Even if it's not specifically an advocacy, it's a way to help and build their own community. And that way, everybody wins. Absolutely. And something I've heard from uh, a lot of people, especially people who ended up running for office, is you know the first step is just taking an interest in how your government works and showing up for meetings, testifying. And what a lot of people have found is, you know, they assumed because they're not experts in these things, like how their county government works, how their state government works, when they showed up and started to take an interest, what they started to learn is that their elected officials are not that far ahead of them. And so it's often, you know, uh, intelligent caring individuals will just realize, I think I could actually do a better job than they do. And so that's, what I think, a lot of time what gets people interested in running for office in the first place. But even if you don't want to take that step, right, just you showing up and talking to these people and figuring out how things work can really make a, a major impact, especially at the local level. Yeah, to, to reiterate on your point, when I ran for uh, local office here in Des Moines, that was probably the one or two reason why I ran is I, I attended these meetings and I found that folks making these decisions, whether it be a local ordinance on that, you know, say LGBTQ rights or, you know, how to fix potholes, the folks making the decisions aren't much more intelligent or knowledgeable than you or I or the person watching this. They just have the time and the interest to stick it out and be there. So running for office may not be that big of a leap as you may think when it comes to ma helping make these decisions and building community. Yeah. And all right, we got one more uh, viewer question, and this is a, um, a different topic, but a really good question where they're asking, um, uh, you know, looking at that uh, uh, demonstration I gave earlier, signing up for action alerts, they're wondering what information does uh, FFRF or the FFRF Action Fund collect on members who sign up with the Action Center? And um, it's a really good question. So what you, uh, uh, what we get, and I'll, I'll show it one more time when you go to the Action Center, um, the specific information that you have to provide just for the, um, the program to, to work is you have to, I'll, I'll log our Thomas Jefferson out really quick, you have to give your first and last name, your st a street address so that we know where you live, and your email address. That's the essential information. And we take our 
uh, member and advocacy uh, advocate privacy super, super seriously. We don't share any of this information with anybody. Uh, the only way that it goes to anyone is if you take action, um, the emails you send will uh, look like they came from you, right? Because they did. So they will come from your email address. Uh, and then a lot of times we will put in that email as our suggestion to prove you're a constituent. We'll say, I'm a constituent located at you know, 1050 Monticello Loop. And so if you don't want that in there, you can go in and, and take it out. But uh, that's all the information that, that has to be in there. If you want to provide us with a phone number as well, you can. So thank you for that great question. Uh, so with that, uh, that wraps up our viewer questions. And that concludes Ask an Atheist for this week. So uh, thank you once again for joining me today, Jason. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Now, don't forget, we also have a weekly broadcast TV show, Free Thought Matters. This week, Annie Laurie Gaylor speaks with Professor Marcy Hamilton about the threats to abortion law in the United States. Here's a preview. Religious liberty in the United States uh, has always been, until the last 25 years, has been the principle that you have the right to believe anything. You have a highly protected right to religious speech. But when it comes to religious conduct, you're not allowed to hurt other people. What extreme religious liberty is, is a belief that your belief is absolute, that your speech should be absolutely protected, and you should be able to do whatever you want for your faith, even if you harm people. So it is a doctrine of harm, and that's why I've been blowing the whistle on it at least since 1997. You can see Free Thought Matters on TV stations all across the U.S. and also on FFRF's Facebook and YouTube channels. Also this week on Free Thought Radio, Annie Laurie and Dan Barker will feature an enlightening talk given by WKOW TV's Senior Chief Meteorologist Bob Lindmeyer on the threat of global warming and what we all can do to help slow climate change. You can find out how to hear Free Thought Radio at FFRF.org slash radio. And don't miss We Dissent, discussions on the state of state church separation from the perspective of three female constitutional lawyers. We Dissent has an upcoming episode featuring FFRF's Liz Cavell on the topic of Christians against Christian nationalism, featuring an interview with Amanda Tyler of the Baptist Joint Committee. If you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. If you're a member already, thank you so much. If not, please consider joining us. See you next week on FFRF's Ask an Atheist.